to start with the City of Auburn. And so at this time, I'd like to invite up uh, not only a, a great leader in our community, but, but also a, a friend of mine and someone who's uh, been able to do some uh, outstanding things in his time in office. Uh, it's Mayor Michael Cook. Bringing 10 to 20 employees to Auburn. 
For those that are not familiar, the Mustad building, once again, as old as me, that was the early, the forerunner of the dollar store, Kmart, Walmart. There was two bargain centers in the city of Armandette being one of them. And being one of nine children, we went there quite often. Prison City Pub and Brewery, downtown Auburn, Don, with Don Schultz. The Prison City Pub and Brewery is located in downtown Auburn in Creative Quarter, and it's Cuba County's only brew pub. The on-premise brewery makes house beers, and the kitchen makes a blend of pub and comfort food with a focus on using locally farmed ingredients. Project funding was provided by local investors, City of Auburn, and Cuba County. If you haven't been there yet, please stop in. Terrific food, great atmosphere. Tinker's Guild and John Mortimer and his family. Tinker's Guild was completely, totally constructed from the ground up after a devastating fire. There is now a 2015 square foot, I believe this should be bar area, with an attached covered patio and site improvements. Ready to serve customers as before. We appreciate John Mortimer and his family's perseverance and commitment to the city of Auburn rebuilding his business, rebuilding his business. Auburn Party Rental, West End of the City, Mark Peters. 14,000 square feet of new warehouse building to accommodate additional storage and needs for his business, for their business, excuse me. Mavis Tire Company, which is on the corner of John Street and East, East Hill, East John C Street. Expansion and renovation of the existing single story automotive store located on East Hill in downtown Auburn. These are all great things going on in our community and we're very, very proud of all of our neighbors and all of our people coming to the area. It's, it's what makes us Auburn, New York. Neighborhood and housing. The village, at, you know, the village at Auburn Grove is Auburn's newest senior citizen, senior housing complex, offering 110 market rate, one and two bedroom units. The $11.2 million project created two full-time permanent jobs nearly 200 construction jobs. Approximately $2.5 million was spent with local vendors in the construction and related trade industries. The S.E. Payne Cornerstone Project focused on the construction and substantial rehabilitation of 16 buildings in the Orchard Street neighborhood, costing a total of $10.2 million. What a transformation in the neighborhood. Anybody, if you're taking the time to drive down through there and see these beautiful buildings, Orchard Street has always been a great neighborhood, but this just adds a little pizzazz to it, and uh, thanks to the neighbors, especially Arlene Ryan down there, for her perseverance in, in changing this around, but it's, it's a nice area to, to live. This public-private partnership project, project excuse, created two full-time permanent jobs and 38 construction jobs. The housing project was a recipient of Central New York Red Sea for support and funding assistance. Broken Manor. In the midst of a $12.5 million renovation project being completed by the Auburn Housing Authority, nearly 44 units are done, and an additional 44 units are scheduled to be completed by the summer. This is a big one, future developments. The VG Rentals, $4 million, purchased a long vacant property at 10 and 14 Genesee Street. The old Auburn floor covering in Picarello's restaurant downtown Auburn, creating three new storefronts and 20 new upper story residential units. This, I, I can hardly wait to see what this is going to look like. And I, and I know one of the principals in there, and I, he's always done a great job, and this should be very interesting and with the different ideas he has. Future development, the Merriman Street Family Transition Project. If you're familiar with Merriman Street, it's in the area of, of uh, Carroll Street, Malone Village, Part of, basically part of Malone Village without being a part of Malone Village. 28 units, duplex top townhouses, style buildings. The Auburn Housing Authority received a $6.4 million grant from New York State Homeless Housing and Assistance Corporation to develop this project. Site plan approval is complete, which is a big hurdle, and the project is expected to break ground in fall of 2015, with completion anticipated in fall of 2016. Eastside Heights, the new subdivision off of Prospect Street up near the college. 52 total lots, single family homes. First home is built, the first home is built, and 50 more lots are to be developed. Harriet Tubman National Park. A 
On December 19th of last year, President Barack Obama signed into legislation the 2015 National Defense Authorization Act, authorized the National Park Service to establish and maintain the Harriet Tubman National Historical Park in Auburn. For nearly a decade, the community has worked diligently to memorialize, memorialize the legacy of Harriet Tubman. One disclaimer we want to throw out there, and we really push this, uh, we have an ongoing communication with the National Park Service, but the biggest message I want you to take away today is don't expect to go up South Street this summer and look for a uh, National Park Service guide or whatever to be directing traffic. It's, it's probably going to take three years at a minimum before this is completed. So it'll be a terrific project. Members of the National Park Service in the near future will be in Auburn for public hearings. We encourage everyone to come and add your two senses what you feel is needed, not needed, and how we should go about it. So we encourage you. Uh, I know we'll have that on our website and we'll be advertising the best we can. We just do not have a date at this present time. Quality of life. That's, to me, that's the biggest thing in, in the city of Auburn, in our county, in our community, quality of life. We need a quality of life to sustain and we have a, we're all trying to encourage the youngsters and our families and our friends to move back to the area. They're starting to come back a little at a time, but it's the quality of life that makes a difference. To support Auburn's high quality of life and to encourage young people to move back to Auburn to start a family, the city must invest in the community. In 2014, the city's investment in Auburn was seen through numerous infrastructure, water and sewer repairs, moving forward sustainability goals and supporting leisure and recreational amenities. South Street Water Main. On the heels of completing the Franklin Street Water Line project, which included the complete replacement of a mile-long 30-inch water main, the existing South Street Water Main also was replaced in 2014. Uh, I, I, I've always been told, I don't know if it's true or not, but the 30-inch main that we had was somewhat of an oddity. I was also told that a lot of it was uh, constructed or formed wherever at the old Elko, which is now Bombardier, which is no longer there either. So when we had a leak in that, it could be very disastrous. But thanks to our city employees and working with uh, everyone else and associated with it, repairing that, getting up to speed, and having replaced is a big difference for all of us. One point, this $1.5 million improvement project replaced deteriorated, undersized water mains and falling service and failing service connections from Lincoln to Clymer Street. And hopefully it'll be repaired very, very soon. So, and I won't even get into potholes because I, I drive the same roads as everyone else does. <laughs> the state dam rehabilitation completed just completed just prior to one of the coldest winters on record. The 3.15 billion structure rehabilitation of the state dam allowed city staff to continue regulating lake levels with the new 36 foot high vertical dip rollers, vertical light roller gate, and five new floodgates at the auxiliary spillway. Uh, the level, in case you didn't know, the level of the lake is regulated, I believe it's by the federal government or the state government, where we, we have a certain level that we have to maintain, and this will help us to maintain it. Uh, we got beat up pretty good last year because the lake level was higher than usual, but we needed to do that for the construction. So, The state dam is one of the most critical infrastructures along the Wasco River. This is as part of the system of flood control devices for the River Outlet Valley. Another bit of useless information, but the drop between Wasco Lake and where the outlet leaves the city is actually higher than Niagara Falls. It's just that it's over a, a, a larger uh, distance, so you really don't notice the difference. At this point, my kids would say, yeah, yeah, who cares? Keep moving. So. <laughs> Our transportation infrastructure. The city is currently in the construction phase for three of our 12 New York State DOT supported highway and bridge projects. These projects are funded with 80% federal aid, 15% New York State, New York State aid, and 5% of local funds. As you can see here, the Walnut Street culvert is receiving much needed improvements and will include road widening for two lane traffic, making it easier in and out at Hoops Park for all of our band concerts and everything else during the summer. The city also authorized $2 million in funding for the 2015-2016 
2014 local road improvement program. Of the 27 streets including in, including in the program, seven streets along the sewer and storm drain repairs will be finished this spring. Transportation, the Wasco River Trail. The city has design approval from New York State DOT and Federal Highway to proceed with the detailed design for the Wasco River Trail. Bid documents for the downtown section of the trail will be completed by end of 2015, and by this time next year, 1.6 million upgrades to the Wasco Riverfront areas from Curley up to the Mill Street Dam will be underway. As you, as you can see, the staff has really been working very, very hard, and uh, uh, Christina Selvick, I'll single you out, because I know you've taken this on as part of your duties, and uh, we're very very proud of you, and we're looking forward to this completion. So maybe next year we can have our, or two years, we can have the, the state of the city and the state of the county on the river trail somewhere. Everybody bring a picnic basket. The city of, of Auburn continues to prove that hydropower is still a viable technology for producing energy in New York State. Not just electricity, but green environmentally friendly energy that is interconnected into the local NYSEG utility grid. This energy is produced in New York and will stay in New York. Following a three-year effort led by city staff and experts in the hydroelectric industry, the Mill Street Dam hydroelectric facility is now commercially operational and has been true producing electricity since September of last year. Open government. Did you know that this year is the 85th anniversary of the City Hall, an hour being open, Memorial City Hall. Another little known fact, there are three Mayor Osmonds in our city. A grandfather, a father, and a son. I thought I see Tim Lattimore here. Tim, did I see him? Tim's the only one close. Tim has two legs of, of the three-legged stool, so. On, on April 5th, 1930, Mayor Charles Osborne accepted the gift of Memorial City Hall from Emily Osborne Harris and Helen Osborne Starrell in memory of their father, David Munson Osborne, who served as mayor from 1879 to 1881. Upon accepting the gift, Mayor, mayor Charles Osborne, Osborne stated, I believe this building actually brings Auburn many steps nearer to the millennium of municipal government. When civic affairs can be considered and conducted free from prejudice, selfishness, and partisanship for the benefit of the city as a whole. Quite a, quite a statement. 85 years ago. Today we live in a millennium of municipal government that Mayor Osborne spoke of 85 years ago. I'd like to begin by reporting to you some of the steps we have taken in the past year to serve the business of city, Memorial City Hall is conducted openly in a manner that encourages public participation. Last summer the city launched its new website in addition to the new look of the site. Many features were added Last fall, the Empire Center for Public Policy ranked Auburn's website number four of New York's 62 cities for its transparency and usefulness. The first feature of this new website I'd like to point out is the new e-agenda system. All city council meeting agendas, along with all supporting documents, are now posted online for public consumption. Not too many, not too many months or years ago, Council on a Thursday afternoon or Friday afternoon received a packet the following week and it contained all the resolutions, all the background memos, and the public was not aware of everything that was going on until it was sprung on a council meeting. Uh, thanks to our city clerk, Chuck Mason, and our former city clerk, now Councilor Devin McCormick, for getting this started and moving forward with it. It's been a big help. This not only opens up council's business to the public, but it has streamlined our staff's time, which is helpful, and efforts in preparing meeting agendas and re reduced unnecessary printing of multiple pages. Participation in live streaming in government, live streaming and budget. Weekly city council meetings are now live streamed via the website. Residents may tune in using any smartphone, tablet, laptop, or desktop computer. If you go on vacation on a cruise around the world, if you have internet, you can watch our council meeting. But um, I, I'd watch the reruns. I think it'd be better if I was going on a round world cruise. The final feature of the website I'd like to point out is the city's, bu city's budget. 
city budget page. Residents can find all documents associated with the preparation of the annual city budget. The city budget is the most important policy document the council has to approve each year, and the process takes several months. All budget materials are posted at the same time they are presented to the, to the council. So everything we have in our packets, you have access to. You're able to ask questions, send us emails, come in person. But you have all of it. I want to congratulate my good friend Mike Chapman on his uh, decision to become fully retired. Mike and I share a somewhat similar background. Mike was a police officer in, in Syracuse, myself being a firefighter. I'd like to tease him and say he'd be a little smarter even taking the firefighter's test, but I won't, I won't say it to him, Mike, okay? <laughs> Mike, is, Mike is a work with many chairmen of the county legislators in my years as mayor. Mike and I hit it off from the very start. Very professional, easy to get, a, get along with, very knowledgeable. He's only a, a phone call away, he's always there. And I don't know of anyone in the area who's worked harder on consolidation or improving city county relations than, than Mike Chapman. <laughs> it's always great to have a cup of coffee with and solve the world problems. So. Now it's my pleasure to introduce our city manager. And I, I just want to tell you a little bit about Mr. Selby. I'm probably repeating myself, but it feels worthwhile. When Doug was formerly the city manager of Las Vegas, Nevada, and he decided he wanted to move back east with his family, and, and we're very fortunate that he did because we've had him with us for a few years, and, and he's, he's one in a million. Counting very quickly, I started with the city in 1973. We've been through about eight city managers. Some of them were good at, at, at the people end of it. Some of them were good at the business end of it. No one to this, to, up until we met Doug, is anyone able to balance both and do a, a terrific job with it. Doug is kind of a humble person. Uh, when he left Las Vegas, they named the park after him. The Douglas A. Selby Park and Trailhead. So to me, that's a tribute to a city like Las Vegas and naming something after Mr. Selby. I recently traveled to Las Vegas on business, not monkey business, it was real business. But I asked Doug for some insights what I should or shouldn't do, and he, he was very forthcoming with it. Shortly after Doug came on board, if you recall, he was hit by a car in downtown Auburn, right near City Hall. Fortunately, he was not seriously injured. The car was all right, so we're very happy about both of those. But it always troubled me. Why, why would Doug come from a city like Las Vegas and get hit by a car in Auburn, New York? <laughs> so I was in Las Vegas, and I noticed that over the Strip and many other highways, they have pedestrian bridges. So I guess Doug in that day, he was wandering around trying to look for pedestrian bridges across the street. So <laughs> having said that, Doug, I see that the way Auburn is growing and downtown is growing, we're going to go with pedestrian bridges, but not for a couple of years. So we want you to stick around. So with that, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Now, Mr. Doug Selby. They say, you know, a city manager has to be uh, tough and flexible. That helps when you get hit by a car. <laughs> uh, as Mayor Quill discussed, the city's moving in a very positive direction. A lot of things happening, continued investment, new projects and businesses, uh, growing optimism in the community in general about the future, positive, visible changes everywhere. I want to share an update on what we're doing in the city and what we've done in city government to continue to support a prosperous Auburn, and even as we struggle with our own challenges, our own financial challenges at, at the city level. It's important really to understand the context in which city governments, local governments in general, operate in the state of New York. Uh, we are supposed to have a lot of discretion in how we operate, yet we're faced with a lot of mandates from the state. We're really, in a lot of respects, subservient to the state, even though we're supposed to be a home rule uh, community. We're required to participate in programs we may not find useful or economical. We're required to enforce laws we may not feel are applicable to our community. We're constrained in how we raise revenues. 
we're given mandates without any funding, and to top it all off, we get labeled by some state level uh, representatives who are not, and I, I will say our local representatives at the state understand our issues, but we get labeled as the enemy of the taxpayer, that we're responsible for the high taxes throughout the state of New York. And the state mandates really continue. This past year, the state passed new legislation requiring local governments to pay the state an administrative uh, fee, notification fee of up to $4,000. We're going to abate a building with asbestos. We're going to do a demolition. So here we have a state with a multi-billion dollar surplus, and they're passing laws not only for new mandates, but also to charge local governments uh, for their, their own costs. So it's a very difficult situation and it creates a lot of demands on local government to work within that environment. At the same time we face these uh, pressures and challenges, our employees are working hard to meet citizen expectations for services. The citizen expectations have not decreased, and in fact, I think in a lot of respects, they have risen as people have looked to their local government for more and more support. They're, we're being asked to address difficult social problems, problems that are complex like drugs and domestic violence. And some of that's reflected in what's happening in our police department. We've had call for services increase 20% in the last year. Uh, so last year's call for services were 36,502. Uh, a large number and a great demand on our public safety personnel. The pressure we're under to continue services or even expand services uh, is not going away, but we've also got this pressure not to raise taxes, and it's forcing us to consider, and, and it's really squishing us down, forcing us to consider how we provide services, what we provide in terms of services, and, and by what means we're, we're really implementing them. The topic, when you talk about services and revenues, it gets most attention, and deservedly so, is property taxes. It's a critical revenue source for us at the city, or the county, or the school. And contrary to popular belief and opinion of some at the state level, again, not our local representatives, most local governments have really done a good job at controlling costs, even before the implementation of the tax cap in 2012. For example, in Auburn, the property tax rate, this is the dollars per thousand dollars of assessed value, is actually 3.7% lower than it was five years ago. The trend to reduce expenditures and, and therefore control the tax levy and, and property taxes in general is clearly evident in the trend over the last five years. The city's assessment uh, of tax levy has grown only about 1.2% a year. Uh, pretty modest considering the cost of a lot of things increasing during that period of time far exceeded that the pension costs, the cost of health insurance for our employees, the cost of, of goods and materials that we use to maintain our infrastructure and provide services. So clearly, even before there was a state tax cap, local government got it, and our local elected officials understood that this, this is not a situation that they need to be told to try to control taxes, but at the same time, we're trying to provide services. Tax levies in, in Auburn have increased in only, as I mentioned, 1.2% over the past five years on average. Um, and this is, this is just an example of the balancing that we, we have to do almost every day. Now, the other thing that we look at is, you know, why would people want to stay in Auburn if our taxes are too high? So we've surveyed uh, cities between 17,000 and 37,000 in upstate New York comptroller put this together for me. And what we found was we're at the bottom of the list. Uh, maybe hard to see from where you're at, but we're number four from the bottom. This, this is uh, a time when it's good to be at the bottom of the list. Usually I can be at the top of the list, but uh, being at the bottom when you're looking at your tax rates in the state of New York is actually a good thing. And I think it helps contribute to the quality of life. And, helps to make Auburn an attractive place to locate a business and to raise your family. I've included a slide uh, showing how the tax dollars, again, get distributed. Because I think it's very important, and I think it sometimes gets lost when people see their tax bill and they 
lump it all together and think that you know the city is getting all this money. But in fact, the city gets about 31% of every tax property tax dollar. Uh, significant part of it really goes to educate our children, very important function. And then and a sizable portion goes to the county who provides regional services both for county residents and city residents. The tax bill in uh, in the uh, city of Auburn is about $105 a month on a $100,000 property. And for that, you get full-time police, full-time fire, crash collection, street sweeping, snow removal, and so forth. We like to point out, with at least one pie chart in every presentation, how we spend our money. Um, this chart reflects our total budget for a year. And you'll see that a significant part gets spent on public safety, 34%. That's police, fire, code enforcement. The next biggest chunk is on our utilities, our water, our sewer, uh, our power generation systems, and our landfill operations. That, that's about 33%. And I should add that that isn't supported by property taxes. That part of the pie is actually supported by user fees and charges. And then, and then we have general government, the next biggest piece which is everything else. It's our public works departments, maintenance of streets, street lights, traffic signals, parks, buildings, planning functions, engineering, and just general administration. While our financial challenges are really no secret, uh, in fact, we talked about in today's paper again, um, we are making significant progress in reaching a sustainable situation for our future. A number of actions taken over the past several years have moved the city's financial situation to a much more positive outlook. But we have a lot of work to, that remains, and we're still in a very sensitive situation uh, should things change from where we think they're going now. Some of the noteworthy items from this past year are new union contracts. We've been able to successfully negotiate contracts with our major employee unions and wasn't easy, but they came to the table, we came to the table and worked diligently, and our new contracts are gonna help us over the long term. We purchased the cogeneration system that had been costing the city a lot of money. By purchasing that, we're out from under a contract that was really causing us to lose money uh, without, any, without any benefit to the city. So now that's, that's in our hands and we're working diligently to uh, maximize the revenue generation from that project. Our comptroller, and this, thanks to you know, having an excellent comptroller, was able to change our health insurance policy in the way it's, a, it's viewed by the state, such that we, in the first year, will save $275,000 in administrative fees that we were having to pay before without getting changed in, in our insurance plan. Uh, we are buying new equipment, thanks to the city council for supporting the purchase of new equipment. Uh, and by no means are we finished with that program. We still have a lot of old, old equipment, but what that does is it actually reduces our fuel costs, it reduces our maintenance costs, and it increases our worker pro productivity because they've got good equipment that they can get in and they can go to work without having to worry about it breaking down. We invested a lot in technology. The e-agenda is, is one example, but through using technology, we're able to free up our staff to do other things, to do more customer interactions, to do more sophisticated things than to move paper around and process forms. We're also allowing more and more opportunity for the public to interact with the city without having to come to City Hall. So being able to make applications for permits and things of that sort. We've also conducted some audits. Uh, one noteworthy one was just an audit of our phone systems and our internet uses. Uh, over many years, the city has shrunk from what it used to be, and when we did this audit, we found about $40,000 in savings by just eliminating phone lines that were no longer functional. In, in one case, we had three phone lines to a vacant lot, where a building had been demolished many years before. Many of these actions were taken because they were, they were pretty obvious. We, we looked at them and we said, this makes sense, let's do it. But we really didn't have a long-range plan until this end of this past year, when uh, the city council adopted a, a five-year financial plan. We did that after our comptroller, Laura Wills, developed a model. She, she, it was a detailed spreadsheet model that had like about 600 lines 
detailing all the line item expenditures of the various city journal fund departments every year for the next five years. And of course, we had to forecast the future uh, using our, our judgment on that. So we presented various models to the city council. They selected one to be the base model for our financial planning activity going forward. That plan was adopted last year and now serves as a tool and a process for us to guide our finances. It's important to think of a financial plan really as a living document that changes every time we have a uh, change where the city council takes a particular action, where our revenue projections change, our expenditure patterns change. So it's a, it's a dynamic document. And I, I'm fond of General Dwight Eisenhower saying about planning, since we're going into battle He's found that uh, plans are really not of much use, but planning is essential. So it's the verb, it's the action, the process of doing that financial plan and continuing the planning activity that is most important for us. Some characteristics of the, of the five-year plan. It places a cap on new general fund debt of $2 million a year. We recognize that we could spend three times that just to try to catch up on some of our infrastructure, but we really can't afford to, to issue more debt because every time we issue debt, we obviously have to start making payments on that, which takes away from our operating revenues to provide services. So we put that cap on. It's going to be a challenge, I believe, for us, but we need to, we need to have the discipline to operate with those kinds of constraints. We also uh, have established a policy for fund balance in local government, your fund balance really is what the state looks at to see if you're financially healthy. It's what credit rating agencies look at when they issue debt or rate you for uh, debt. Our policy requires that we maintain a fund balance between 10 and 17 percent. And to put that in perspective, if there were no revenues coming into the city, we would be able to operate for five to eight weeks and then we'd be out of money. So that's that's pretty much our cushion for emergencies. It's our uh, reserve for un unplanned situations. Uh, the plan is also conservative revenue growth. We assume that property taxes stay under the tax cap and then we adhere to the new tax freeze uh, requirements to start reducing property tax levies by 1% a year for the next uh, three years. It also assumes that sales tax revenue will increase at a very modest 1% a year. This is an example of something since we wrote the plan, we might want to revisit because it's amazing to me, but our, pro our sales tax revenues this year to date were 12% above where they were last year. It'd be wonderful if that was sustained, but I'm thinking that's a blip and, you know, but we're hoping that 1% is, is very conservative and maybe we can make an adjustment to that. Finally, we assume that the aid that we receive from the state uh, will remain constant. Uh, the aid to municipalities and, and our CHIPS funding. The expenditure side of the plan is equally conservative. Uh, we've used our collective bargaining agreements that we now have in place to project forward our labor costs and our benefit costs. We've assumed our staffing levels will remain constant. We've removed our, uh, assumed our operating revenues will, or operating uh, costs will remain constant and that will maintain our services. So the services we have today for the next five years, our plan says we'll maintain those services. But under these assumptions, we're facing a half a million dollar gap every year. So clearly the plan has pointed us in the direction we've got to do something to close that gap. This budget year, we're using the plan that will formulate our budget and through that process, we're going to work to start closing that gap. And that's the value of the plan is we know it's there, we know it's going to exist for the next five years unless we take action early to start to mitigate it. One of the steps in, in planning for the future is to have a vision. Everybody here probably has a vision for your family. You probably have, if you're in business, you probably have a vision of what your business uh, would like, you'd like it to be under the ideal situation. Maybe you haven't written it down, but I'm sure you thought about it in your mind. For us, it was important as a city to also have a vision of the future. You know, what, what's our ideal state? So after some discussion and deliberation and wordsmithing, we came to the council, their input, 
staff input, and we resulted in a vision statement that recognizes the historical significance of Auburn in areas of creativity and civic engagement. Auburn's rich history in those areas is basically our vision for the future, to continue that, to build on that, and to, and to continue to advocate for those activities. Likewise, we have a mission statement. This is what really guides us on an individual basis, day to day, tells us, and tells the community, really what we're focused on trying to achieve. We're far from perfect. Uh, this is a mission statement that's challenging to achieve, especially when, uh, and I hate to say that we're, when we've got so many potholes, to say that you know we're proud of our infrastructure. But we are committed to working on it, and I think that's as important a message as anything, is that we're gonna do our best to meet this mission. Now, the area of cooperative government, I wanna say, talk about one thing and then touch on something else that I know Suzanne's going to discuss. Um, governments really today must continue to work together. Uh, we've had some really good discussions and interaction with our friends at the county that are growing into projects and initiatives and efforts that I think will yield benefit in the future. Uh, but I think also citizens are expecting it. Yeah. I don't think people uh, who are paying taxes care if there's one government or two governments or three, as long as it's economic, it's providing the services they need. But the one way to do that is really to, to work together. An exciting new project that, that we conceived of, and it's now in its planning phase, is for a new uh, public safety building. This would replace our 1930 era police and fire station, which although those buildings are beautiful and they're historic, they really, we're gonna to have to make significant investments, I'm talking about millions of dollars, to maintain them for their intended purpose, and they'll still be inadequate. Uh, there's still a lack of parking, there's still difficulty getting modern fire equipment into the bays because of the size of the, of the openings and the floor structure. Um, we're very poorly equipped to serve the public. If you've gone to the police station or the fire station, you realize it's even hard to figure out which door to go in. Um, we, need to, we need to work to remedy those. And the idea was to create a new operations headquarters for our police and fire department. But not only that, but to open it up and see if we can work with others who have similar public safety challenges and create a building to serve all of us, where we can share training rooms, we can share reception areas, we can share uh, common areas to the benefit of everybody and help keep our costs down, and maybe get some synergy from everybody being in, a same, in the same building and interacting with each other on an informal basis. Uh, so our concept is a modern, efficient, regional public safety building, which might also house people uh, from the private sector. The, the concept is that we put a request for proposals out. That, we have an architect working with us now to prepare that. Put that request for proposals out to the development community and ask them to provide us with a facility that we could lease that would provide all the, the uh, accommodations that we need as well as any other tenants that might be willing to join us and allow that developer to add in private compatible retail, maybe some residential even. It's been done elsewhere, it can be done here. We believe it will speed the project and will provide us with a, a very economical opportunity to get a project like this going. Uh, the, the other effort that we're working closely with the county on is working with, on our fleet. And we both have public works garages, we both have fleets to do the same kind of things. And I'm gonna not say much about that because Suzanne will, will discuss that with you. I'd like to wrap up with a word about our employees. So we have great, dedicated employees. Mayor Quills mentioned how good our, our employees are. Uh, I know the snow wasn't everybody's favorite, but our, our folks work very hard around the clock to try to keep the streets clear. And we, you know, that's just an example of, the, of their diligent work and their dedication to support the city and citizens. But I'd like to know we. So you all, we lost one of our, our employees this past week, uh, very suddenly. Uh, Andy Busco served as Assistant Corporation Counsel for the city. His passing leaves a large void for all who knew him, and especially for us at the city, where his hard work, his professionalism, 
his love for the city, and his quick way to help make all of our jobs more pleasant. So we'll dearly miss him. Every year at this time, we try to recognize a city employee, an outstanding employee. And we've got a lot of great employees, so it's always difficult for me to pick from the ones that get nominated and presented to me. Um, I think all the city employees, however, would agree with the choice this year. Um, and it's not just because without this woman, none of us would get paid. Uh, it's because the way she handles herself and, and how she provides her services to all of us at the city. Um, she does it with honesty, integrity, quality, and teamwork, which are characteristics that we've adopted as our, as our value, our core values at the city. Uh, Vicki Quimby is a 20-some year employee at the city. She's a one-person HR department. She's really a kind of senior payroll clerk, but she does so much more. She serves over 300 employees in five different bargaining units, with three different health insurance plans, two different retirement plans, with six different tiers, uh, time sheets with shift differentials, and holiday pay, and uh, incentive pay, and sick pay that differs from contract to contract, uh, and it just goes on and on. To say nothing of the fact when we do negotiate a contract, there are wholesale changes to as many as 50 or 60 payroll uh, documents that she has to process as well. She schedules her, her lead time and uh, basically around around our payroll. She's a person that's so dedicated that she'll change her, her vacations or her time off and uh, I know she hates to even take sick time. Uh, her office door is always open. She's always there to explain benefits or questions on payroll from any of our employees very friendly, very uh, uh, important employee, key employee to, to our operation. So I'm very happy to recognize Vicki Quimby. Vicki, can you stand up? And I'd just like to thank uh, the folks who make the mayor and I look good. Uh, Christina Selvick, Steve Selvick, Jenny Haynes, Chuck Mason, Lori Walter. Uh, thank you for the slides and helping us get this pack together. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, uh, Manager Selby. Appreciate the uh, information. Lots of good information. Lots of good stories. Uh, some exciting things. Obviously, some challenges still that uh, you guys are facing. And appreciate the leadership from the council um, and, and the great work of the staff to, to help continue to provide the services for the residents in Auburn. Um, we're going to move to the county presentation. And uh, to begin that, I'd like to introduce uh, someone who's uh, one of my many bosses. Uh, who sits on the board of, of CETA, but also has done a tireless job as chairman of the legislature uh, for the last uh, few years in bringing um, really just a, a desire and, and a, a wish to see good projects move forward, to see collaborations happen. Um, you know, I can't say it any better than, than Mayor Quill said it, uh, acknowledging the work that he's done. Um, but, but honestly, uh, Chairman Chapman, we, we are in good places right now because of the things that you've done as chairman, and I welcome you to the podium to hear about the county. Thanks to everybody for their kind words. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I'll miss it, uh, but I'm going to go have some, some more fun. So I want to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for this honor and the privilege. Many thanks to our colleagues from the legislature and the city council and all the elected employees and all the elected officials. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you through 2014 and jumpstart 2015. Your input, your knowledge, your perseverance make for a great team. I also want to say thanks to our planning department. I want to say especially uh, Steve Lynch and Nick Colas for putting the slides together for me. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's beyond what I uh, had expected. I've talked before about teamwork. 
I spoke about the importance of having teamwork as a foundation for great success, and that remains a constant in our society. So what does our team here in Cougar County need to maintain us as a destination, as a place where people will want to raise families, maintain their businesses, and bring new businesses? And I know nobody wants to hear about potholes, but we do have potholes and puddles. So our infrastructure needs some attention. Just like most other counties in the state, Mother Nature has truly tested our metal this winter, tested our roads. But in order to promote the area, in order to receive supplies, in order to receive our basic needs, enhance tourism, the desire to run a business here, the desire to provide for development, we're going to have to use more funds, more for repairs, more for paving. We're going to have to be creative and utilize different methods to find a better efficiency. I think if we all take a trip someplace, one of the things we remember is our ride there and our ride back. I know I've had several telephone calls about uh, conditions of roads, but uh, believe it or not, some folks have actually thought it was a great ride in from another area, from another part of our state, into the Finger Lakes region and back out again. Also, this coming year, we're gonna ask for additional collaboration on various services and projects with our towns, our villages, the city of Auburn. We're going to be again looking to enhance our agreements for the plowing, maybe take on the mowing, perhaps some road work. We're going to have to share in grant applications. One of the success stories is, uh, and I compliment Jim Mormon and his staff, is they started collecting taxes in the town of Springport this past year, and that service may expand. We worked previously on broadband with towns in the southern part of the county. We're going to look for other opportunities to cover the entire county. The governor has a program that he's introduced, and we're going to follow up on that. We've seen the fruits of collaboration, but we must continue. We have to continue for services to remain and improve. We're going to continue to work with our other partners, our other counties and organizations. We're going to make more noise on the mandate issue. We've seen some relief in Medicaid. But as I was commenting to Dan Fezzan before we got started today, in seven and a half years on this legislature, in seven and a half years in making trips to Albany, we have talked about the same things, asking for mandate relief, and it hasn't arrived. We cannot be satisfied to remain in the status quo. Let's talk a little bit more about the state level and effects on our budgets. We've got this 2% tax cap. Well, it's a great goal, it's a great guide, but it's not one that all counties can embrace instantly. Just for example, last year, Madison County raised their taxes by 12%. Wyoming County to our west, 8%. And there's a whole host of other counties that had to exceed the tax cap more severely than we did here in Cuyahoga. Tax dollars need to stay here, or they need to come back here. A little bit about budgets. This is not a fun topic <laughs> until we say yes, but we're going to again initiate the process very shortly. We're looking for changes that can be made to continue the services without a burdensome tax rate. We all know that hindsight's perfect, and we know from that view we can keep rates low year after year, but then you're going to experience that catch-up with a remarkable increase. Our course should be one that is measured and that it's going to take time. Clarity in the process is absolutely necessary for everyone to understand and to remove any doubts about what we're doing. We need thoughtful and committed planning. I also want to mention that a few years back in 2003-2004, for example, Cuba County had to raise taxes by 16.5% and a little over 20%. And if you look at the previous years leading up to that change, all the tax levies were very, very low. So there's the catch-up that I mentioned. Last year, we used money from our fund balance. We raised the tax levy above the 2%. We did that, and, and in doing that, we learned in the process that only 1% raise in the tax levy equated to $370,000. So when we did the 2.9%, 
with all the funny math that Albany provides you, we are raised, we raised approximately $1 million. Well, when we have a $140 million budget, and, and we can actually tweak $39 million out of it, uh, that's not giving us a lot of money to play with. So attention is needed in the year of mandates again. And at the same time, the county's got to be aware of any opportunity that's out there that could affect the monies we work with. One of the other things that the county's been doing, over the past four years, we've reduced our workforce by 200. We didn't fill positions as they became vacant, unless they were related to critical services. And we held each position, if we could, for a period of 30 days to enjoy, if you will, a little salary sweep uh, for the future. We're going to continue to do things like that because that's the right thing to do. So let's talk about some positives. Let's go back to collaboration. We've collaborated with Loretto in the Syracuse area to establish a long-term care facility for this region. That process has been slow, sometimes painful. It's not over with yet. We continue to wrestle with the uh, Department of Health folks. Cuga County has not stepped away from this partnership. Uh, we're right there with these folks when we talk to our state electeds and the Department of Health, and we reach out to the governor's office and have a conversation uh, almost on a regular basis now. We have Cuga ingredients. And now we're going to have a new company that's going to be coming in to join with them that's going to enhance the number of employees and, and add to the dollars that are invested in this community. We have downtown revitalization. We've got businesses expanding. We've got new businesses introduced, new jobs. Our nonprofits are working hard to keep our community services running. We know some jobs have left. That occurs everywhere. We're not unique. We now have schools who are offering new courses related to workforce development. Our agriculture community continues to expand. We are working with the city of Auburn to combine our motor pools. We've been selling gas to the city of Auburn for quite some time now, and, and this, for me, is a great step forward to more collaboration because I think this is going to be a great success story. And then it's an easier sell, if you will, both to the community and to the employees that are affected. But these pockets of the prosperity, they need to become a wave that covers the entire county. That's what's going to make us a better place. We have a lot of people, our neighbors we know, that travel outside of Cuba County to go to work, but they live here. Because it's the best place to raise a family because of the great schools. We are the 18th healthiest county in the state. Thank you to all the healthcare people. <laughs> Along with all the pluses, we've now gonna enter this phase again where we have the regional economic development competition, if you will. You've heard the governor and a lot of other folks uh, talking about all the uh, the billions of dollars, if you will, that, that it's out there. So we're going to be competing for dollars related to projects in this region. The pot's larger now, it's more diverse. We're going to need to explore untouched areas from our past attempts. And one of those, just for example, is workforce development. So we're going to have to key in on that. I think most importantly, uh, all these things that have been mentioned take people. People who cannot fear to ask questions, who cannot fear to consider alternative options and stray from that well-worn path into a new arena. I know we have such people here in our community by what's happening, working in our departments at every level. The government is somewhat slow, and hopefully we can change that. We can become more nimble. We can become more adaptable. This is up to you and me here in this community. We must continue with encouragement for ideas and keep that discussion going on. I think all we need to do is look around. We've got a lot of success. It's been happening right here in front of us. It's going to continue. 
but we do need to join together for our future and for all those that follow us. We need to stay together. Thank you. What, one of the items we didn't discuss was uh, if there would be a challenge from the city to the county or the county to the city. And you know, last year I said we should go over to uh, the Double Days Field and play some wiffle ball. I guess I'm, I'm going to stick with that baseball unless the city has some other option for us. We accept. Okay, here we go. And now I want to uh, turn the podium over to our county administrator, Suzanne Sinclair. Suzanne, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, getting together your presentation today. And uh, we look forward to uh, some of the ideas that you brought to us coming to fruition. So if you would, please. Well, good afternoon. Um, someone promised me a clicker for the, uh, aha. Thank you. So I'm very pleased to be here once again, um, talking to you. Uh, last year I came and I talked, um, primarily about our budget, and so I will pass along what was given to me once, um, as good advice for public speaking. He said, always follow the three B's. Be prepared. Be brief and be seated. So I know that everyone's had lunch and, and you're all, they've listened to some very exciting talks. I talked last year about um, the budget and the fund balance primarily. And I certainly agree with the city manager's remarks about the relationship between state government and local <coughs> government. You know, state government continues to have wonderful programs. I listened to, um, NPR on my way home one evening and listened to someone who was being interviewed about the Raise the Age initiative from the state, you know, to raise the age from 16 to 18 for an adult, and that the state was prepared to pay for all of those costs that would be associated with that. And, you know, sadly my experience and my observation in New York so far has been that the state does pay for things at, at the beginning, but then they start tapering off. And that's when it starts to be a, a burden to the counties. It's not that the programs are necessarily bad, but it's hard to pay for those programs when you are dealing with a regressive tax like property tax. So that's who I am. <laughs> um, This is, I, I actually put this up on the screen last year because I was concerned about the situation where Cuba County was relying on their fund balance. And the, the number that's in red there, the $3,048,454, is how much of the fund balance was used to balance the, the, four, the 2014 um, budget. And, you know, we have the money and so that was great. Um, and we, we went forward, and it was, in fact, less than the year before, because we, we recognized, uh, myself and, and the budget director, Thunder and Ellen, um, recognized that we needed to do something about this. The fund balance is a resource for emergencies, and it also provides working capital through the year, so that we're not having to borrow short term for unnecessarily for operating expenses. So this is part of the graph that we looked at last year, and I'll go through these pretty quickly. The entire bar represents the ending fund balance of the year indicated. And it, the part light green portion is the part that was being allocated for the year following that. The blue bar represents the policy level that the, the legislature had determined was necessary to, to maintain a good, solid line of reserve. And when you're using $3 million of fund balance each year, it wears down pretty quickly. And it would have ended up, you know, going into 2017. Going into 2017, that we would have um, 
been short by, you know, we would have been down in the $5 million range, which is not sufficient. I put this up last year, too. This was my, my goal for Cuba County. The current expenditures are supported by current revenues and cash reserves and fund balance are within the policy range. I also had visions of a, a tax smoothing fund. Our expenditures this year are very similar to last year. We did manage to eliminate um, 11 full-time positions and 9 part-time positions, so we, we reduced the possibility of hiring. Those were, with only a couple of exceptions, those were vacant positions at the time they were eliminated, so we did avoid trying to in, impacting our, our employee force. Gone is the nursing home, which would have carried with it about $8.1 million of, of expenditures. Now here, this, these are the total revenues, and it shows the new property levy tax, but the important part I wanted to, to point out was that on the lower left-hand corner where it says fund balance, the fund balance we used to balance the 2015 budget was $300. $72,000, $890. I was, I, I have to really hand it to the legislators this year because there were some very difficult choices that were made. And this is as, as close as I could ever have dreamed of coming to a, a truly balanced budget in such a short time. And, and I really think that that you should recognize that they did a, a heroic job trying to get that down. That's a reduction of 88%. So I mean, I think that's pretty impressive. In fact, I, I repeated it because here's what it was last year. And here's what it is this year. <laughs> so instead of the incredible vanishing fund balance, you have uh, a, ban a county that has stabilized their fund balance. It shows it here as, as slightly below, but we've had some impacts that are things, you know, even if you start with a fully balanced budget, life happens and it's not always, you know, it doesn't play out according to plan. But we had some good things that happened. We had a slight reduction in retirement contribution rate. Am I, am I, can you hear me? Okay, it's cutting in and out my ear. Um, the retirement contribution rate went down slightly. We received some local government assistance of $700,000 in lieu of some property taxes that, that do not come from, from tax-exempt properties. Um, the Medicaid was estimated to be flat, and now appears that we might have a significant reduction in expenditures that holds true through the year. Um, the nursing home fund, um, we think we can pretty much close out, and that has a net effect of uh, moving $2 million into the, the fund balance. So what does that do? That actually brings us to a place where we fall back within the, the policy range and we can look forward to, to trying to keep it there, um, although that will be a challenge. We need to keep things in revenues and expenditures in equilibrium. And the important part of that is that, of course, it keeps your taxes lower which is our goal. It may not feel like it all the time, but it really is. But I'd like to also tell you about some other things that are going on in, in the county. Um, the city manager pointed out that 22 cents of your tax dollar goes to the county, so what are we spending that on? Well, this is our new Viper system in E911. And what you're looking at is the Power Ops reporting screen. It shows what's going on in 911 at any given time. Uh, the calls in progress, any calls waiting, and where the staff is, what station they're at. Um, it's a very, it's much more sophisticated system than we have had previously, um, and it's very similar to what Onondaga County has. Because I did take a trip up there, I wanted to see um, what other 911 systems um, and offices work like. One of the things that I love about working for county government, in fact, is the sheer variety of stuff that, that you get to learn about and work with. This particular one is uh, a phone screen. This is a call made by our 911 director, Jenny Spengler, from her own phone. And you can see on the right, there's an incoming call, D. Spengler shows, and on the left is the call information. 
And when you look at the, the, the acronyms up there, the ALI is Automatic Location Information, and that identifies land lines and cell phones. The ANI is the Automatic Number Information, identifies the landlines. And RTX will be used when the county deploys text messaging, which is actually imminent. In the event of a catastrophic failure at one or both of our 911 centers, we can route our calls to neighboring counties, and they will be virtually invisible to either the caller or the responder. So it's really pretty exciting. Also new with the Viper system is the MapFlex system. This shows almost instantly where a caller is located when they call. So you can see in the large yellow circle shows the location of the caller, and the blue section to the left shows the coordinates of the location, which I learned that in 911 lingo you say lat long, which stands for latitude and longitude. But the big yellow circle shows that, you know, true to form, and, and like a good county employee, Denise was in her office when she called. And so you can see it's very similar to Google Earth. I don't know how many of you use Google Earth, but they, um, it will help emergency personnel find a place and to, for 911 to direct them there, and they can give instructions such as the caller is in the third house on the left after you cross the bridge, and, and that will be a huge help to, to help keep all our county citizens safe. We help support the drinking water that, that we enjoy right around Auburn and, and the environs. Um, Owasco Lake is a, is a major source of that drinking water. And in the upper left, you can see the monitoring buoy on the lake, which is watched, read, and maintained by Dr. Hackman, who's in the, the lower picture there. The county contributes more than 22,000 annually to support the monitoring. In addition, the county has contributed cumulative in-kind work in securing state funds to protect Owasco Lake and other county water resources. Uh, we contribute also to the bacteria testing in the lake. Uh, one of our legislators, Mike Didio, participates in a group that focuses on the Owasco Lake Watershed. It's the Owasco Lake Watershed Management Council. Bruce Natale and Eileen O'Connor, who are also on our county staff, um, help to, to support those organizations that monitor not just Owasco Lake, but also Cuba Lake and the Seneca River. Here's what um, Doug was referring to earlier about the city and the county motor pool. This is an aerial shot of the county's um, highway facility on York Street. And you know, local governments have been working together for, for years um, in a very informal way, trying to save their taxpayers money and, and collaborate. This is now becoming a more formal process. Here's the, uh, the, the city's public works facility. Um, those of you who have young children will recognize the McDonald's across there at the, the street at the top of the picture there. And so we did, I had identified the city and the, and the county have been talking for some while about ways that we could work together. We're, we're, we do similar but slightly different things. And so in the similar areas, there, there seemed like there must be an opportunity for cooperation, collaboration, and, and economies that could be gained. So we identified um, mutually as the motor pool as a place where we could, we could start that work. So our goal was to co-locate our respective fleets of passenger vehicles and light pickup trucks and ultimately to generate efficiencies from having a, a single, pool, single motor pool maintenance facility operation. And there's the same picture. So the proposal right now, um, it's not formally proposed, but it has been kind of laid out to both uh, legislative bodies, is to relocate the county motor pool to the city's facility on Genesee Street. The city and the county staff would operate for a, a year, possibly two, in the shared facility. Um, they would not join operations at that point, but we, we view that as a learning opportunity. We're going to learn about how each other works, 
learn and identify opportunities because they, it's always in the details where those economies can, can take place. In year three, it seems like it's an opportune time to, to start joining those operations if, if in fact everybody you know, sees the opportunity to go forward with this. Um, a fleet manager to help standardize the fleet and the parts that go with it for maintenance. And the design of a construction, a design of a new facility. Um, we have talked about locating that on York Street, but really the location is, is one of those things that will be discussed as the, the project moves forward. We would hope that in year four and year five, the construction would take place and the facility would be then ready for occupation by, by both teams. So in fact, we're meeting this afternoon, um, Mr. Selby and myself and the other members of that small committee that are working on that project to, to take a look at, at more data on the cost of revising the buildings to make it workable and to, to look at a possible agreement to, to function in those first few years. The county also supports economic development and the legislature made a commitment in the 2015 budget um, to include support for a, a capital projects that would help create uh, opportunities for economic development. Um, occasionally, this, these shots are of Eagle Drive, so occasionally things come up that, you know, it's that extra little bit that will help um, a business come and locate in Cuba County or in the city of Auburn. And then I would just like to mention that we have also, uh, uh, we've developed over the last couple of years at the behest of a group that started before I did, uh, before I came here, um, to recognize our employees. It's called the Employee First Program. It began with recognition. The uh, chairman is a big supporter of the program, um, and rightfully so. It's, it's a great opportunity for us to call out those people who have done something exceptional um, gone above and beyond the call of duty, as it were, to, to serve the public. And, you know, and really that's what government um, workers are about. We are about working for the government. Nobody ever comes into government with the idea that they're going to make a zillion dollars and retire. Um, they're going to come and, and they are participants in their community on a daily basis. And so we've expanded that program. Um, we are looking for ways to save money, and often the people who are right there in the trenches know the best ways to do that. And so we are, we have a program we've tried to broadcast that encourage people to make those suggestions. Um, we've also started a forum, so it, it comes to me. So be, be judicious about the questions, but um, you are welcome to, to contact um, the county administrator directly if you have a question, and just to let you know what's on their mind, the first question I got was, why are there no parking spaces? So I, I fielded that question. Um, I thank you. If anyone has any questions, I'm more than happy to, uh, to respond to them. Um, but I will call it quits here in the interest of being brief and being seated. So thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Amy Fuller, the Chamber Manager. I want to thank the city and the county for their presentations, and we are very fortunate to have a government that works together. I also wanted to once again thank today's sponsor, Tompkins Trust Company, and acknowledge Tompkins Trust and First Niagara as our diamond sponsors. Um, just a couple quick things. Uh, nominations for our Chamber Awards Luncheon are now being taken till April 10th. That includes member businesses, the Leadership um, Cuba Award, and the Terry Bryan Becker Award. Um, I leave you today with a quote from Audrey Hepburn. Nothing is impossible. The word itself says, I'm possible. Have a wonderful afternoon.